Hello everyone, this is Vipul Puroit and I welcome you once again to a, another session. This is going to be a theoretical session and the title of this session is Environmental Chemistry. My dear friends, this is part three. In the first part, I explained you with respect to carbon monoxide. In the second part, I explained you with respect to carbon dioxide. Now, in this third part of environmental chemistry, I'm going to consider oxides of sulfur. So we begin with the sources of emission. The first one we talk about is thermal power stations. These are the major sources of sulfur dioxide, combustion of fossil fuels, in thermal power stations, they produce sulfur dioxide and they are released into the atmosphere. Next is sulfuric acid industry. During the manufacture of sulfuric acid, generally being done by means of contact process. The second step is oxidation of sulfur dioxide to sulfur trioxide. Now in this case, around 96 to 98% sulfur dioxide is converted into sulfur trioxide and which is then further converted into sulfuric acid. So it means that four to 2% sulfur dioxide is being released into the atmosphere. Next we have is about smelting of non-ferrous ores. Smelting is all about heating of a substance in presence of air. So general examples can be given with respect to zinc sulfide, lead sulfide. So when these are being heated in presence of air, means oxygen, so it gets converted into metal oxides and sulfur dioxide. So if I have ZNS, I treat this with oxygen, O2, it gives me zinc oxide and sulfur dioxide. Next we have our petroleum refineries. Now in this case, when you talk about petroleum refineries, there are waste gases which are going to be emitted from the heaters, boilers, furnaces, and so on. Now they do contain sulfur dioxide, which is obtained due to the combustion of sulfur, okay, which is being present in the fuel used. Also, the emissions contains hydrogen sulfide from the refinery units, which are being subsequently converted into sulfur dioxide. Next point we have is external combustion system, where as I said earlier also, combustion of fossil fuels such as coal, petroleum, they are the major sources of sulfur dioxide. The sulfur which is present in the coal is oxidized to sulfur dioxide. And then around 3% of this is being further oxidized to sulfur trioxide. Next, we talk about internal combustion. So in most of the mobile vehicles, the internal combustion engine is being used. And in these engines, there are going to be the fuels that we are going to be using that contains sulfur, so which gets oxidized to sulfur dioxide. And this sulfur dioxide is going to be emitted in large amounts by diesel engine. Now, comparatively less amount of sulfur dioxide is emitted from the auto engines, okay? So these are, though it is considered as a minor source. So my dear friends, these are the various uh, sources of emission as far as sulfur dioxide is concerned. We now move on to the next part and that is about the reactions, fate. Now in this case, the predominant reactions are, the first is the catalytic oxidation of sulfur dioxide to sulfur trioxide. This is one of the most important step as far as the synthesis of sulfuric acid is concerned. Next is we have a hydrolysis reaction also taking place of sulfur dioxide. That is SO2 undergoing hydrolysis resulting in the formation of H2SO3. This is sulfurous acid. Next is we have a formation of a sulfuric acid by photochemical oxidation. 
Now, how exactly this takes place, I'll tell you, and that is, uh, it is a continuous step whereby SO2 is first oxidized by SO3 by means of a catalytic oxidation, while in the gaseous phase, it is oxidized by photochemical oxidation. Okay? So photochemical oxidation means it is an oxidation taking place in presence of light. And then it gets subsequently converted into sulfuric acid by the addition of water molecule. Okay? So sulfurous acid and sulfuric acid can be regarded as the secondary pollutant because they are going to be formed from SO2 and SO3. So SO2 primary pollutant, SO3, H2SO3, H2SO4 are considered as secondary pollutant because they are going to be formed from SO2. All right. Next part we're going to, and that is the reactions of H2SO4 when it comes down in the form of a acid rain. Okay. This concept, I guess, you must have heard before as well. Now, normally what happens is the rainwater is slightly acidic. The reason is because the carbon dioxide which is present in the atmosphere combines with water to give you carbonic acid. But then the pH of that acid rain or pH of the uh, rainwater is somewhere around 6. Okay? It's going to be around, say, 5.6 to 6. In that range it is. But then when sulfuric acid, then the pH of that rainwater drops to around 4, 5. And greater the decrease in pH, greater is going to be the acidity. Now the reactions will be SO2 plus O2, sulfur dioxide undergoing oxidation, uh, addition of water taking place. This is water comes out from the rainwater which you are referring to and it gives you sulfuric acid. Also sulfuric acid reacts with ammonia to give you ammonium sulfate. It reacts with the marble and the limestone. The reaction is there in front of you, calcium carbonate treated with sulfuric acid. So it gives you calcium sulfate and with the release of carbon dioxide gas. Now, some other reactions we continue with. Uh, direct oxidation of sulfur dioxide to sulfates also takes place by treatment with uh, metallic oxides. So uh, the reaction is magnesium oxide being combined with sulfur dioxide. So it gives you magnesium sulfate. So here there is an oxidation taking place of sulfur dioxide to sulfate. We can also check it out here, the electronic excitation of sulfur dioxide, which is going to take place because of the absorption of solar radiations. And the wavelength region is going to be around 294 to 394 nanometers. So here we go with the reaction, SO2 absorbing the UV rays coming from the sunlight. And as a result of which, SO2 is electronically excited. Sulfur dioxide on excitation becomes more reactive and therefore it reacts with oxygen to give sulfur trioxide and nascent oxygen. The atomic oxygen is nascent oxygen, which is also quite reactive. It then combines with the molecular oxygen resulting in the formation of ozone. The retention time, to how much time it is going to be retained in the atmosphere, it varies. It all depends upon the source. It all depends upon the concentration. And that is going to be from around, say, two hours to six days. Okay, this is what is the range of retention time of sulfur dioxide. We now go touch the most important aspect, and that is about health hazards, because we call this as the pollutants, obviously. We need to concentrate on the health hazards. And here you can see, purposely it has been kept in red. So you understand that it is going to be hazardous. It affects the visibility and it leads to the reduction in the brightness contrast between the objects. Okay, so it affects the eyes in particular. Elderly people with a heart and lung disease are vulnerable to sulfur dioxide pollution. 
So that means it has an impact on the respiratory system who are already suffering from those problems that gets aggravated due to exposure to sulfur dioxide. The green pigment, which everybody knows, is chlorophyll, which is used during photosynthesis, is also being affected. And it is actually the chlorophyll which is responsible for the green color to the leaves. So if the chlorophyll is going to be affected by sulfur dioxide, so the direct impact is the leaves lose the color. The sulfur aerosols can result in bronchioconstriction, okay, a situation which is similar to bronchitis, difficult in breathing. All these situations do develop. It attacks the vegetation. And for a country like India, it's going to be a major problem because India is an agricultural country. So obviously, uh, a damage to the vegetation causes a significant damage on the Indian economy. It causes nose, eyes, as well as lung irritation. Materials which are composed of limestone, marble, they are all being attacked by the secondary pollutants. The best example which can be given is the damage to the Taj Mahal, okay, by such pollutants. The, the appearance of Taj Mahal is deteriorated because of the exposure of the secondary pollutants in the atmosphere. Okay, so this is in a nutshell about the health hazards as well as the other damages which are being caused due to the primary and the secondary pollutants of oxides of sulfur. So now, with these health hazards very clear in your mind, we now go into the control techniques because once we understand that, yes, it is hazardous, so it has to be controlled. Now, how it can be controlled for easier ways of doing that is, first is the catalytic process. So here we try to make sure that the primary pollutant, the concentration of which can be reduced as much as possible. So, in the first step, SO2 plus O2 giving SO3, this is catalytic reaction. The catalyst which we are going to use is vanadium pentoxide, so as to ensure that the maximum amount of sulfur dioxide is converted into sulfur trioxide. And then the sulfur trioxide is going to be absorbed with water, resulting in the formation of sulfuric acid. Okay, so in this way, you can see the concentration of sulfur dioxide is reduced to a considerable extent. Of course, it does result in formation of sulfuric acid, but then when we try to compare the damaging effect between sulfur dioxide and H2SO4, sulfur dioxide has a greater damaging effect. Okay, so in a way we can say that from more damaging, we are going towards the less damaging part. Okay, sulfuric acid of course can be used in various processes also, okay, so that it is not freely available to cause damage whereas sulfur dioxide is a gas, okay? So uh, it can spread on to a much more greater extent. Now, as you can see, the second process we have is the sodium sulfate process. So in this process, what we do is, we take sodium sulfide, that is Na2SO3, sodium sulfide. Now this sodium sulfide is being treated with sulfur dioxide and aqueous medium. It gets converted into sodium bisulfide, that is, NaHSO3. So in this way, you can see SO2 is being converted into a less toxic sodium bisulfide. The next one we have is a limestone injection process. Here what happens is the limestone, the chemical formula is calcium carbonate, is being subjected to a very high temperature. Now in this case, calcium carbonate decomposes to give you calcium oxide and carbon dioxide. Calcium oxide is also called as lime. And then this lime is further treated at high temperature in presence of sulfur dioxide to form calcium sulfate. So you can see sulfur dioxide being converted into calcium sulfate. The next we have is a limestone process for the removal of SO2 and particulates. Now here in this case, uh, a simple reaction which was being dis discussed before as well, the calcium carbonate decomposes into lime as well as carbon dioxide. Now here what happens is that the limestone 
is being mixed with coal and the mixture is going to be injected into the furnace and then you can see the reaction limestone undergoes a thermal decomposition resulting in the formation of lime and the release of carbon dioxide now the lime which is going to be formed is being treated with sulfur dioxide and oxygen resulting in the formation of calcium sulfate all right so in these processes if you can see these now four processes the more toxic sulfur dioxide is being converted into less toxic i don't say that the conversion materials which i'm going to get they are not going to be toxic at all i don't say that but then the damage which is going to be caused can be reduced to a significant extent by converting a primary pollutant into a secondary and a tertiary pollutant so in the catalytic process as you can see sulfur dioxide is being converted into sulfuric acid in the sodium sulfate process sulfur dioxide is being converted into sodium hydrogen sulfide in the limestone injection process it is being converted into calcium sulfate as well as in the limestone process for uh, particulate matters it is being converted into calcium sulfate so these are the control techniques with respect to sulfur dioxide so i hope my dear friends you have understood this very well thank you very much